good to see you. Good to be here. Um, thanks for that last song, Dan. I've, and I mean, for all of the worship, but the cross has been, I mean, you know, it's central to our life, isn't it? And the cross is the cross. But it's been especially um, resonating with me the last few days. And um, I just want to talk about something that's happening in our land and around the cross. In 2009, a proposal was put forward to erect a giant cross in the centre of Australia. And a request was made at the time for support, like prayer support, financial support. And we as a house contributed to the financial support because this was going to be a multi-million dollar project to get this huge cross into the desert. Um, And we gladly contributed to that project with prayer and and with money, but approximately at the same time, um, where Dan and Sarah, so the church Dan and Sarah were part of in Orange, where his parents were pastors of, they had a, another elder who was also an Aboriginal elder, whose name is Glenn Reid, that, that we met, and he, he had an urge, and they put together a couple of teams, and they went by horseback, east to west coast across Australia, and north to south, in order to make a cross across Australia. On that journey, they were building a can or an auto, if you like, every 100 kilometres and dedicating that to God every 100 k's on their journey. And we gave them like four litre cans of our anointing oil to take with them and pour on each can as they went. So as a house, we've really seeded into this great Southland of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's dear to all our hearts, you know, and we all pray. So, you know, we've, um, we've seeded in. And uh, um, last September, the project for the cross came to fruition and that cross went up. It was erected on Memory Mountain near Alice Springs. Erected by and with the permission and acceptance of the, the First Nation tribes there who are the Arunda people. This Easter is celebrating the formal opening and proclamation of that cross. People are already going there. You know, we look at what's happening overseas and maybe we forget to look what's happening in our own country sometimes. God's on the move. You know, and this year, Bob reminded us on the other day that Ramadan, Passover and Easter fall at the same time again. They did last year, for the, and that was the first time in 33 years that they've fallen together, but they fall again together this year. And it really impacted me last year, and I thought, here we are, different faiths, three different faiths, if you like, but we all worship the God of Abraham. We all have the same Father, you know, but what separates us is the cross of Christ, isn't it? Big separation. And, you know, as, Christmas, as Christians, the cross speaks every day yeah, so deeply to us. And whenever we sing anything about the cross, it just, it has, it resonates so deeply in our spirit, doesn't it? It's so, in, it's the crux, literally, of, of who we are. And, but, but we can see, Christians across the world, we can see that God is moving across the world again. We've seen him do it before. We've asked him to do it again and we know the signs of when he's moving again and the signs are out there again. So we're all watching the experience in Asprey and we're hungry for God to move here in our land. But he's already working. He, you know, this project started in 2009. He has this subterranean current that he's always moving on something. And there's a giant cross now in the middle of our land. How about that? 20 metres high. You know, there are vibrations and frequencies of the Holy Spirit. They're already going out in waves across this land. And we as a house, we're part of that. We've been part of it and we are part of it. As small as we are, as faceless as we are. And that's been the word of all the prophets that when God moves it through a faceless people, well, we can certainly put a hand up, you know. But we're part of this. We're part, we're part of his cross. It's just, it's, it's just astounding that he uses us like this. You know, it's such a privilege to hold the cross of Christ high, unashamedly. And, you know, also our privilege to come to this table 
where not everyone is in, invited. The invitation has gone out, but not everyone has responded to that invitation. And we also come in obedience, don't we? We come by invitation of Jesus to this table, but we come in obedience to his asking us, come and do this and remember me. And we respond to that in obedience. We respond out of love. We, we respond out of gratitude for our salvation that we can come to this table and celebrate his birth and his death and his rising at this very table. And we're moving into this time of Easter where that's even more profound for us as we contemplate and reflect at this table and then as we prepare for Easter, you know, and this cross that has been erected in our land... This is a profound declaration. Imagine this cross. I don't know if they have or not. Hopefully they have. There's been millions on it. Imagine it lit up at Easter. How far? It's in the desert. There's no other lights. It's, imagine how this is going to be seen. You know, Stephen just had that prophetic word. There's going to be a light shining in this land this Easter that just will clean up all this defilement that we've had through our city in these last few weeks, you know. So, you know, as we come and we celebrate, we just so celebrate this amazing gift to us that we can come to this spiritual table and be fed in our spirit to to carry us on. This journey is not easy. To be a Christian and to do this journey is not easy and we need strength. And this table Jesus has put for us to to, to feed us and, and empower us with, with that strength that as we, as we watch it, and if you're watching by YouTube, I encourage you, Google 20 metre cross in Memory Mountain near Alice Springs and you'll see this. We've got a little video that we are going to, to, to look at as, as we share communion, as we contemplate, as we reflect, as we thank Jesus for what he's done and for what's going to happen in our land. Amen. Praise you, Jesus, precious ransom, my Redeemer, truthful word, blood and body offered up, your life has paid my debt in full. It's with some sadness that I announce that Tom Gardner passed away overnight. Tom Gardner is a great friend of this church. He wrote Healing the Wounded Heart, Turn Towards Mercy. Uh, We visited him in America. He's been to this church a few times. We walked his little legs off around the opera house. Um, His wife rang me this morning so he passed. He had long-standing, he was waiting for a kidney transplant that never came and he died in his sleep. Strangely, he died with COVID, isn't that strange? Uh, I loved him a lot. Um, In um, my life, what I've learned from the book of Nehemiah is that it talks about rebuilding the walls of your life. And what you need to do as we're seeking... See, you meet, don't you, in your life, you meet someone, they come to God and they say, well, look, I was a heroin addict. I used, to, I used to sell the family's groceries and all of that. And I met Jesus and all of a sudden, um, all of a sudden, all that left me, right? And then you met people, you meet people. They say, well, I was a heroin addict. I'm still working through my problems. See, we have things in our life um, that often it takes time. So Nehemiah waits. It takes four Persian kings for him to get back there. But he is a cupbearer, which means he's the food taster in the court, in the court of the, the king. And uh, the king sees he's sad one day 
and offers him the resources to come back to rebuild the temple. And when he comes back, he starts to rebuild the temple, which is the inner life in us, our inner life, the holy place where God lives in us, our temple. How long do you think it takes him to rebuild it? To rebuild the walls and reinsert the gates. 52 years. 52 years. So if you think we're a bit slow, we've got a few years to go. But the reality is, he got, I believe in this book of Nehemiah, he showed him a plan. See, the, the devil is an equal opportunity destroyer. He seeks to destroy you and he has an agenda to destroy, destroy you. And what I have sought to do in my life, and I haven't always been successful, but it's my heart to do it. And God spoke to me about it even overnight. In the areas of my life where I'm re- rebuilding the walls of my life, but they're still too, they're still too um, short to keep the enemy out of my life completely, then I just don't want to pile on there a whole lot of stones. I want to, get, I want to put on there stones that are going to be able to stand against the assaults that are coming over the walls at me. For example, if I have a trouble with my finances, I don't want to appoint, appoint, appoint to my support system in life a five or ten bankrupt people because they're just going to be as weak as me. And I'm not going to want to appoint people who, who struggle with sexual morality. I'm not going to appoint people who struggle with rage or people who struggle with different things. I'm going to look for people who can stand in victory. See, I could stand with any man in this place concerning my marriage. Why? Well, I've been married 54 years. So I must be doing something right. Not to say I'm doing everything right, but, to say, but, but it is a strength in my life. And... We've got to, God wants us to rebuild the walls of our life so that we can, we can keep a safe place within where we can worship God so that the temple of our life is rebuilt. And um, an alternative talk, of a uh, uh, title for this talk is called Praise the Lord and Pass the Ammunition because... In the Ukraine at the moment, we see mapped out modern warfare, which is a frightening, frightening thing. But you know what happens to all these mercenaries and whatever? They could have all the advanced weaponry in the world, but if they have no bullets, they can't use them. They just look nice. And, um, and you sit there and you find out that... Um, Russia has fired, say, 20 missiles at the Ukraine. And some of those are hypersonic, which means they can't be stopped. Ukraine has no weapon fast enough to stop that. But every time Russia fires a hypersonic missile at something to stop it, it's a few million dollars. So it's a law of diminishing returns, isn't it? And so... We, as, as the people of God, for, for me to sit there and for me to say to you, I believe that we're going to overcome. I know it's a big statement because we can feel like we're being overcome. And uh, I think mental illness is a great affliction in people's lives. And as, as someone who's been there and done that, we need to, don't we, as the people of God, look at like a book of Nehemiah and say they all went to war with one eye on the wall, building, and the other hand on their sword, building and battling at the same time so that the walls of the city were rebuilt and, and rose to the point where it stopped the enemy getting in. Now we have... Don't we? Gates in our life, like the eye gate, the ear gate, the mouth gate, these gates 
that are meant to control what we allow in and out of our life. And and in this book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah, by the way, his name means comforter. So he's there. You imagine he goes there, and it doesn't tell us how old he is when he goes there, but we know it takes him 52 years to rebuild the walls. So whatever age Collie was when he went there, he was 52 years older when he finished the task. A lot of times... Uh, a lot of times uh, there's a lot of pressure on us because when he gets there in Nehemiah chapter 4, his enemies come against him and Sam Ballot said, heard that we were rebuilding the wall and became angry and was greatly incensed and ridiculed the Jews. See, it, this is really bad English. It said he became angry and greatly incensed. So it's a double double negative and he's angry because the Jews are rebuilding the wall. Because constantly they'd sneer and say, what are you doing, you feeble Jews? What can be done with you? And this is one of the primary attacks of the enemy. We'll say to you, Emma, who are you? Who do you think you are? What have you ever done? What will you ever be able to do? And get us looking at ourselves and our failures and our problems rather than the Word of God. The Word of God is our anchor. It's where we anchor our life. And uh, I, in my life, I've had people, and God's been talking to me about that I need to replace some of these people. And I felt as I got older, and a lot of people who have been like, on my, the walls of my life helping me have died. Three or four in the last couple of years. I had a man standing on the walls of my life called Brian Carmody who, who rang me once or twice a week for 30 years. And he'd asked me how I was. And he challenged the way I answered him. And he'd it really um, is one of those guys, if his house was on fire, um, he'd be smiling. He'd find something positive in it. You know, I mean, he, one of the most positive people he'd ever met. And he also owned, a, owned with his beloved wife, they owned a flat which was walked to the beach at Queenscliff. So when it was holidays, he'd ring me up and say, do you want to come down and stay at my place for a week? So... I missed the beach house and I missed him and I missed his humour and his interaction. It was my privilege in life to lead him to Christ. And uh, as a Catholic man, he went to daily mass for 25 years. You know, like 25 years. The second guy um, was a man called... Professor Richard Hibbert, who was um, who was one of the deans of the Sydney Missionary uh, and Bible Alliance College, and he had a um, he had a double doctorate. He was deputy principal, and when he he was a doctor in Wollongong practicing, he was he became a Christian the last year of medical college, and he never practiced medicine. Immediately he went um, to Turkey and ministered to the Turkish gypsies for 20 years. He could speak fluent Turkish and he was, a man, he was just a man who was good. He was a good man. And when you were in his presence, you felt good. And he used to come down and take Tanya and I out for a Turkish feed or an Iraqi feed, and he could always go and order in their mother mother tongue and all of that sort of thing. And he was um, he was a man who really helped me stay on the straight and narrow by always coming back to the Word of God and sound theology. So in a low wall in my life, see. You can be, as a Christian, like a river without banks. You can be so full of God but with no containment. So what happens is you're flowing out everywhere. 
but you're not being contained and you're not really blessing the people that you're falling upon. And he, he was a very, very deep friend of mine. And of course, Tom Gardner, who died overnight, was an author. Uh, he, he would say, he would ring me up and say, you're one of my best friends in the world. And you know, when you've got someone, you're their friend and you've done nothing. I've done nothing. I did nothing. Just, hello, Tom, how are you? And we shared. And he, uh, I was very close to him because we had a similar sense of humour and um, he saw life the same way. He saw church the same way. And he was a Mennonite um, and he played the trumpet and uh, he lived in Pennsylvania in horse and buggy country. And he floated in and out of those Amish type churches over years. But he was a professor of Hebrew. And these people influenced my life. They just influenced my life. Another man who was here, Peter Higgins, who was here, influenced my life because if he did a job, he did it from start to finish. Even when he was driving you mad, he was finishing the job. So if you and him asked, for, if you agreed for a task to be done, he would do it. And he drove me all over Sydney in the night. And, you know, there are people like that who can be attached to your life. And God doesn't want you to have in your life all me to people. He wants you to have in your life people who can push buttons in you. That's why when the scripture says, talks about marriage, it says as iron sharpens iron. Because there are places in marriage where you can go with your partner in marriage that you can't go outside of that relationship. You've got no one to go outside with and uh, they wouldn't put up with you. So as we come to rebuild our life, we have to be exposed so that we bring the low walls of our life into God's presence and allow God to rebuild them. And that can be very confrontational and, um, and, very, um, uh, and very hard to find the right people, but God will send them into your life. I just gave you some really diverse people. I didn't search them out. In the case of the theology professor, we went to give a talk in Tasmania and I didn't want to go much because they, they asked me to come and give the talk and then they, every few days they'd bring me with a few questions. And I said, look, I said, obviously you don't, you're having a few doubts so I won't come. So I say I won't come and I'm... I'm in bed and I have a dream. And, God, and Jesus comes to me in the dream, right, and said, you've been asked by the man of Macedonia and you must go. And when we turn up at the airport in Launceston, this bloke comes out and he's got a long beard. He's the man from Macedonia that I saw in the dream. See? And uh, we had a... Uh, we had you know, some wonderful encounters with God there. And I just say that we, we've got to be working on our life. We've got to be allowing God to touch the touchy parts in us. And I find as I get a bit older, I get a bit crankier or a lot crankier or whatever. And I've got to allow God to do with that stuff. And it's not easy. It's not easy to face yourself as long as I can say, well, really, it's Colleen's fault, oh, it's Matthew's fault, it's Tanya's fault. But when you have to face yourself, and the only way you can face yourself is that we know the scripture tells us that perfect love casts out all fear. And we're told that he who's not made perfect in love fears, because fear involves punishment. And, uh, and so God invites us to come close. So 
In Nehemiah 4, 2, it says, And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish it in a day? Can they bring the stones back from those heaps of rubble burned in the fire as they are? Can you be used to reform a solid wall again? You see, and the enemy will be challenging you all the time. And we say to Bronny, what about your mistakes? What about this you did? What about that you did? And he comes with accusation all the time. See, you might say to God, well, God will tell you to do a job and what he does, he gives you all your days to do it. And it might take all your days. And it might be finished by someone else after your days are finished. But if it's meant to be done, it'll be done. When Sam Ballot, Tobiah, the Arab and the Anamites and the men of Ashdod heard the repairs of Jerusalem walls had gone ahead and the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. Why? The enemy doesn't want you to defend yourself against him. He doesn't want you to be keeping him out of you, keeping the enemy out of your life. And he'll use anger and accusation against us. You see, what the enemy threatens you with, he mostly can't do. The enemy has told me he's going to kill me at least a million times. I don't know, a thousand times, I don't know. I'm still alive, aren't I? I've got a working trolley and I'm still alive. You see, the reality is we, we are meant to be able to have intimacy with God. So I'm sitting in this meeting tonight with you. We're all together down here. And all of a sudden I see a flock of white owls. Huge flock of white owls lying down among us with a frog in their mouth or a lizard in their mouth or something more despicable. And uh, uh, I didn't recognise all the enemies. Uh, It wasn't a study in nature. It was a study in victory. A study in victory. Because we have allowed ourselves to be pulled off track. We're sitting here and we're watching TV and a large church in our city is accused, has been accused, right? Not proven, but been accused of being better shoppers than the Kardashians. More effective shoppers than the Kardashians. $16,000 skateboards. You could buy me a $20,000 skateboard, I'm not going to be ever going to ride it. I'll never be able to get it. I'd be able to get it going, call on the hill. Stopping to be the problem. <laughs> See, we all here have a Nehemiah burden to rebuild people around us. I look at some of the things people in my family believe, some people in my family believe, I'm horrified. I have a look at some people that I meet round the place, what they believe. I, I meet people who tell me it's okay to be whatever gender you want. It's okay to have whatever opinion you want. Everything's free unless you disagree with me. Then it's not free. Your, you know, we all have desires. Your dream might be that you have a great career, that you might have a great family, that you can have an effective ministry. The Lord wants our dreams to come true if they line up with his will for our lives. I believe God would want to build something great for our lives. Using this ministry as one of his vehicles to do it. 
You see, I don't need people to be reminding me of how old I am. I only get up out this chair to remind me. You see, we have a task to do. And while ever we're being faithful to God, we'll get the equipment from God to do the task. Because whatever we ask to do is beyond us to do without God's help. We can't do it. I'm flat out. Who finds it easy to be kind to people? Okay, Give yourself a bit of a mark. Would you give yourself a 10 out of 10 for kindness? Or is there any room for improvement? Could you be a little kinder? This is a life that's easy to talk about but not easy to live. Your success will be determined how you respond under pressure. Sometimes I've responded really badly under pressure. Or how you respond under adversity. I have, res- I have responded under adversity very poorly. But sometimes I've been brilliant. Sometimes I've been like a a shining star. Sometimes I've been so exceptionally kind to people, I shock myself. (laughs) But you know what I know? I serve a God of new beginnings. I serve a God where he wipes the slate slate clean. You mightn't wipe the slate clean. That's got to be your problem. But he, he wipes my slate clean. See, Samballat and Tobiah, they raised themselves against Nehemiah's vision. It's the devil's business. and See, it's none of the devil's business that you're going to do a work for God. But he makes it his business. He makes it his business. And he wants you to have this sort of like Luciferian behaviour. Behaviour of the Antichrist. When the devil is cast out of heaven, he takes, he takes angels with him. And starts to set up an alternative kingdom. He says this in Isaiah fourteen twelve. You have said in your heart, I will send to, to the heaven. I will raise my throne among the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mount. Here he is throwing out his challenge to God's authority. Can't you hear this in the voice of news presenters and social commentators? You can hear this statement. I know better. You're this. You're this. And they, if you like, have got hold of Luciferian doctrine and they are coming as angels of light against us. It's like this sort of thinking comes against us. Jesus said that by my stripes you are healed. The doctrine of the devil comes against you. So you ask, am I really healed? Can I be healed? Is healing possible? I tell you what, if we don't believe there's healing around, there's a lot of doctors making a lot of money out of us really. When Salat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and greatly incensed and he, and he ridiculed the Jews. This putting down of people is a tactic of the enemy. Who do you think you are? Why would that person like you? Look how you look. Look how you speak. 
Look how you sing. And he says, what are these feeble Jews doing? Because what it means is the enemy's trying to say to you, what you're doing has no value. What you're doing has no value. So Colleen, um, you donating this uh, a small amount of money here, a small amount of money there, this uh, not polluting the uh, environment you live in, uh, what do you think you're doing? It's nothing. It's worth nothing. It's worth nothing. Throw your plastic in the ocean and enjoy life. What do you think you're doing? I'm paying to invest in a Christian life that's going to be an investment for which I'll receive a return in heaven. And they come and they come against Nehemiah. Will you be able to do that, Wall? The task's beyond you. You've got poor material, poor workmen, poor working conditions. Even the union's giving you away. Because always it's about your ability to do things. I was... Um, when the enemy comes against me, the, the Bible tells me when the enemy comes against me like a flood, God will raise up a standard. God raised up a standard. So as God raised up a standard, read what the standard's got to say. Read what the standard's got to say. Beloved Son of God. God says that I am more than a conqueror. It's not my idea. It's his idea. I'm more than a conqueror through him that loved me. And one thing that I can do and one thing that I am doing is close the gates, close the gates of my city. As God is rebuilding the walls, close the gates. Watch what I'm looking at. Watch what I'm listening to. And you know the biggest open gate in my life? My mouth. My sharp cutting tongue. I could hire out my tongue to a barber so he could use it to bail a strop, sharpen his razors. Because you see, God is dealing with me because it's, I couldn't really fight when I was a kid, but boy, I could give a bit for me corner. And you see, can, you can defend yourself with your mouth. So I can, you know, sometimes you've got to shut that mouth of yours until your tongue's bleeding. You can feel it bleeding, you know. And and I want you to read the book of Nehemiah as your homework. Just read that book and put, your, put yourself in there. And when the devil says to you, what can these feeble Jews do? So I can do a lot. I can do a lot. I'm a long way from being finished. And I have... My friend Tom Gardner, I have Carol Gardner ring me and said, Tom considered you to be one of his best friends. And I've got to say to you, I was shocked. Why? Because I had done very little. I have done, I had done what I would consider normal things. Nothing heroic. So your kindness may be a lot more heroic than you know if you keep it up. I pray for your families. You know, in my, in my own life and in my own circle of friends, I've had plenty of family drama. Has anyone had any family drama? And the thing is, often you, often you can't fix it. It's not fixable. And the other thing that happens is if someone doesn't like you, you can't make them like you. If someone thinks badly about you, they're going to think it. And so Tanya often quotes the scripture about the empty praises of men. 
You have to be able to hear the high praises of God. You know the scripture? With the high praises of God in my mouth and a two-edged sword in my hand. So I pray for your family. I pray for the situations in your family that are so painful you can't even look at it. I pray that you would see the end of your life and you wouldn't worry about getting there. You just know if God shows you the end and he's made your promises, he's a promise keeper.